I wish I had more more excitement than that. But um, yeah, we're going to be discussing feminine rage in media, culture, literature, and how it has impacted our lives and shaped discourse in society. And another reason why I'm so excited for today's episode is because I have two amazing friends of mine with me, Aruba and Shagarika. Guys, could you please introduce yourselves to our audience? Hi, um, my name is Shagarika, and I'm very excited to be here as a very angry feminist. Um, I'm currently in my third year of university at UBC studying political science and gender race and social justice. Woohoo! <laughs> Hi, I'm Aruba. Uh, I'm a proud Bangali, angry feminist, and uh, I'm a psychology major in Taylor's University, Malaysia. Okay, so I'm like already super excited. So um, as I said earlier, if we just jump into today's episode, we're talking about feminine rage, and we'll especially be talking about representations of feminine rage in um, mainstream media. So it includes films, movies, cartoons that we grew up watching, and um, literature and also our culture and how it impacted us growing up, how it impacted people around us, how it shaped discourse on feminine um, anger and rage in society. And also what these representations kind of tell us about how the society feels about feminine anger. So yeah, to begin with, like to go into that, do we want to talk about kind of what feminine rage is for us? Shavika, do you want to talk about what like anger is for you, feminine rage, what makes you angry? Where does one begin? Um, I think being, living as a woman in any part of the world, there's so many reasons to be angry. And for me, feminine rage really begins with just, it's, it's multi-generational. It certainly didn't begin with me, but it has to do with the historical oppression of women and the systematic devaluing of female emotions and I think that's one really interesting thing that we're going to get into today is how feminine rage has been policed and created and deconstructed through society so for me I think it's something at once really personal but also part of a larger uh, sense of solidarity. Everybody, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, for me, I feel like rage is something that like I get from like personal experiences and from society and all around the world things make me angry so much, but I feel like male, gay, uh, male anger and female anger they are seen very differently and we're more used to male anger than we are with female anger and I feel like that causes a lot to repress our, our anger. So I'm excited to talk about those aspects and why we have come to our, you know, how can fix that, how things can get yeah, better. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, I think another really integral element of feminine rage is like Aruba mentioned how society treats it so differently than male rage and the expression of female anger is inherently seen as something to be either ashamed of or to repress and another aspect that I'm really excited to get into is how it's vilified um, throughout media and literature and our own homes and whereas male anger is seen as a sign of strength. Definitely, I think that's why it's important to talk about feminine rage. I mean, of course, anger is an emotion that everyone faces. It's like the primary reaction to injustice. It's a way of showing that you're bothered, you're disturbed, something's like um, bothering you. But there is a transfer of how, of reactions to um, male anger and feminine anger. Like how, mm -hmm. like anger as an emotion is definitely very, very gendered. This is something that we talk about time and time again. And that is definitely why we're having this episode today to kind of explore how is it gendered and like how it has been shown to be like gendered in the media that we consume. So we keep talking about media. Do we guys want to talk about like, um, the kind of representation of feminine um, rage that we had growing up in media. Because for me, honestly, um, the first thing that comes to mind is all of these Barbie movies. I think the first one yeah. was like um, yeah. Fairytopia or something. Like, yeah, Fairytopia, one of them didn't have wings. So th there are these two characters, right? The main character who we're supposed to root for is this obedient meek, caring, um, family-oriented, soft, probably like sings like an angel or whatever, like just that very soft girl. Uh, and we're supposed to root for her while 
the the um, antagonist is like um, angry and wants power and is ambitious and like you know wears neon green nail polish or something. But just there was this stark contrast and like I feel like just this vilification of women who are ambitious or like you know not yeah. you not always nice to people around them stuff like that kind of put it in my head that those were the kind of women that I didn't want to become. Yeah, I definitely think that ambitious women were portrayed very like negatively in like cartoons and stuff. I feel like we didn't have those like positive, like ambitious women that we should have seen growing up. You know, I do feel like it's like getting better in that sense. We do have books and stuff for like our young generation, but like as us growing up, I didn't have that. I didn't have that with Disney or any of the cartoons, like very few, like maybe Pocahontas, but majority like Cinderella, Snow White, all of that. I feel like it follows that like trend of purity and innocence and silence and being meek, being like peak femininity, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think piggybacking off of that, um, growing up for was is full of all these representations of these super effeminate women who were always expected to sacrifice their um their ambitions and their senses of self to be seen as desirable. Like what comes to mind immediately is, you know, like Aruba mentioned, like Disney princesses and other animated shows. Like I think of Kim Possible, for instance, where um, the villain is always this woman who ha is clearly more invested in power and is more driven by self-interest. Whereas the um, protagonist or whatever, she is always, you know, family oriented and gives so much of herself and she's seen as sort of the pinnacle um, and you know viewing these representations growing up it's entrenched a lot of really harmful gender expectations into us because suddenly little young girls are taught that ambition is wrong and if you're if you want to be doing things beyond what is given to you yeah. you're evil and that treatment of you know uh, emotional autonomy is something that I think is extremely gendered because you never see male characters, whether in cartoons or in, you know, films for older people, you never see male characters who are, who are ambitious and who are taking up that space or with their emotions, they're always treated as, you know, a hero. Powerful. Yeah, a hero. I think it's interesting to draw, like, although our episode is on feminine rage, it's interesting to draw on these, like, contrasting characters, because when we saw um, the, the villain or someone who's ambitious and angry, and um, when we saw them suffering bad consequences at the end of the show, or like, when she's finally defeated, yeah. like, it just sets up the narrative in our mind that they're going to suffer, that we are going to suffer consequences if we dare choose our social advancement or our ambitions and, you know, choose to be angry and hungry for power over being, like, you know, modest and kind absolutely i i think what you highlighting that rage is always viewed as as wrong and yeah. i think that that gendering of that experience because as you mentioned at the beginning that rage is a universal experience but you see in um for instance i think of the hunger games which was you know young adult fiction which is really yeah. powerful and influential um, for, you know, us uh, westernized youth in Bangladesh, it's, you have a very rare female protagonist who is, you know, powerful and domineering, but you see that she is, like, vocally against, you know, makeup and dresses and the like, yeah. like, markers of femininity and softness, but she's also yeah. angry. So I think, I'm curious yeah. to hear your thoughts on this really yeah. interesting. I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up because I wanted to talk about that whole phrase, I'm not like other girls. So I feel like we grew up seeing like majority of these girls like on TV and we couldn't relate to them. So it, like it came to like thinking that, oh, these girls, like women are one dimensional characters. Like I feel anger and these characters, they're not like like that. So I'm not like other girls, you know, I'm more multifaceted. So that, I feel like that's where it came from, from media, like portraying women as these like flat characters, you know? There's definitely a masculinization of anger. It's never seen yeah. as something that the woman can feel of her own accord. It's always yeah. something that she does that makes her yeah. less womanly. I mean, if you think about it, how many of the times are the women who are expressing anger masculine themselves? I want to see some extremely feminine women expressing anger. That's what I want to see, you know? 
because they I exist. read this before growing up called Garbodharni. So um, one of the female characters, there's one female character, like, so she's like, they're talking about revolution and all of that. So she's very into that, right? And she's very angry at her dad and her family affairs. So she's, you can see that she's angry. So she does have that um, kind of aspect to her character. But yeah. then again, she's also proud of wearing t-shirts and jeans instead of sharis. Mm. Like that, like, during that Masculine. time period. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's like, even when you allow these female characters in media to feel anger, it's only after their character confirms to this, like, Masculine. Yeah. Masculine notion of, like, you know, because only then is their anger kind of accepted by others, like by her other guy friends or by people around her, or yeah. even by the reader, like, themselves, I feel like. Yeah. Absolutely. I think there's definitely this, the boundary of respectability is so different between the genders. The, not only is female, what it shows to us isn't that female anger is just valued less. It's that there is the limit of what is accepted by society yeah. it, for men is so different for women. And I think that also really um, highlights this unspoken social convention that this, we're not allowed to be expressive. That is not yeah. right. And it, it, you see it framed so often in, yeah. in, Bang- in Bangladesh as, you know, Beadobi or yeah. a nostro. And I think yeah. language like that really reinforces how it goes against the expected yeah. meekness. You know, with this, this thing that Shagra just said about how we're not allowed to be angry, I feel like it's this concept about how a lot of white people, they don't see racism. Like, they just, like, refuse to say these things are racist. So I feel like when Sagar says something like this, like women might be able to agree, then there's, there must be a lot of men who are feeling, oh, is it true? Well, you have to think about the fact that how many times have you seen a girl get shut down when she's trying to speak, when she's trying to be expressive, when she's being angry or being like, you know, expressing her issue with something happening, you get shut down. And it's a very common thing. So just think about that. Like for, for the guys watching this, if you feel like anger is not gendered, I truly feel like just do some introspection. Think about like situations where you saw your female friends be shut down, you know? I think it's not just vilified. Like we, uh, time and time again, we've been talking about how it's been vilified and everything, but not just vilified. It's also kind of reduced and humiliated. Like how many, in how many movies have you seen just this girl getting angry about or upset about something and then having like these intense emotional um, outbursts or fits, yeah. like hysteria yeah. or yeah. like, the, the male character just going like, you know, you're cute when you're angry. Yeah. Are you on your period? <laughs> Talking about, yeah, are you on your period? Like, that's the epic way of reducing, like, someone's anger. Are you on your period? Like, I, I it really speaks to how the, there's this reinforced, socially and through media, this reinforced notion that the woman is her emotion, but the emotion, mm-hmm. because it's valued less, is also inherently less than the male expression of the emotion. And that's why I think you see so many tropes throughout film and television and literature of like the mad woman or the lonely, bitter, angry woman, the crazy ex girlfriend. So true. Uh, there's a word for like um, someone who doesn't choose to get married. Like that's a trope as well, archetypically. Like the spinster. Yeah, the spinster. The well spoken lady who doesn't need to get married, like, is like portrayed as a crazy crack cat lady, you know, who couldn't get married. But, like, speaking of Arundhati Roy, she lives alone and she was talking about how, like, she could easily, like, get someone to live with. She just prefers not to put anyone else through, like, being who she is. Like, she's very creative and stuff. So, oh my God, do you guys watch this interview of Cher where she was asked that, you know, are you bitter when you say that you don't want, like, men, like, you don't need yeah. men? Are you yeah. Bitter? Basically, that lonely, bitter woman who's just so bitter and like mm. agonized and painfully lonely that she can't get a man, and she just went like, "I love men, but like I don't need them." Hello, I am the rich man yeah. that my mom wanted me to marry. That That's was cool. so bad. Men is like men are like dessert. You, you, they're not a necessity; they're a luxury. So I love that. Yeah, so if women like dare think like that, like Cher or Arundhati Roy, these are like perfect examples in our media and in our circle as well. Like if women choose to feel that way, if they choose to stand their ground and have that personality, I think it's just, yeah, they get, they, they fall in, into that trope. I mean, it's just not acceptable that they probably just want to be like alone and they're okay with it. They're always Lost thrown into this trope of being. <laughs> yeah, like. Speaking from like personal experience, this like whenever you go to speak out and stuff, like I've literally been told when I was like talking about politics and stuff passionately, like with my friends, like this guy, and he's like very well spoken. He's a writer, 
and everything a poet and he says to me tumi to me tumi politics ni ki jano like i have nothing else to say about that except like what the, what the, i have something that? to say about that i think it really you know sheds it really highlights how culturally entrenched this lack of value of female emotion is and particularly of feminine rage it's just seen as it doesn't matter if you have you know degrees and experience and extensive professional credentials it's your our rage is just seen as less and i think that reductionary treatment is something you see throughout history and throughout um the culture that exists today and that's perpetuated by language and by social media mm-hmm. and also within ourselves yeah definitely I think of like so many women's movies, Jamon, um, Sex and the City, I think I watched it a long time ago, so I don't really remember, but like these women tried to be independent and like angry and like, you know, fiercely confident. And at the end yeah. of the day, like, I think most of them ended up with men. Yeah. Or <laughs> their, I, what comes to mind is just how extraordinary the act of, you know, being sexually expressive or independent and and standing your ground which is something you know i think deters a lot of women from expressing their anger that fear of oh if i stand my ground right now mm-hmm. you know what am i inviting what kind of resistance because there's always resistance mm-hmm. and another example that comes to mind and i think it's just it really demonstrates the boundaries present for us that we're forced yeah. to be in these restrictions placed by society that really goes to show how there isn't an acceptance of anger of angry women and gender yeah. diverse people in fact it's almost it's wrong and women who choose to um you know come for whether in media or in you know our personal lives they're always they're either ostracized or you know conversed upon on mass by people who don't agree who have a lot of vocal opinions or they're consigned to the tropes we spoke of earlier like oh yeah. just another feminist bitch ask the say you know it's a lot of that language yeah is, uh, there might be like the Salem witch trials and all these like other like um burning women for like like what having a baby like out of wedlock mm-hmm. and stuff like that like it's like oh uh, how about self immolation of women like in india but when a man used to die they would like set fire to the women in his burial like actually they like they, they would burn the husband the dead husband and uh, an alive wife So the fact is that we we have a history of having to fight and to having to get rid of these things because these things were not got like didn't get rid of it like these things didn't just like get abolished by themselves there were people who campaigned against it who worked really hard to get rid of it like even like aren't that the Roy was talking about how we have to fight for even like you know, being, being able to vote you know like no one really gave us that right we had to fight for it so i feel like with anger as well i think like trying to like put like that effort of like being able to like express our anger a bit more like being like more thoughtful of the fact that no i'm going to talk about this i'm going to express my thoughts and you're not going to shut me down because my words have the equal va- equal value as yours so don't don't do that you know okay, so radical like, um since we which child we don't say that um since we talked about which else maybe we could move into like feminine rage and culture but before that um since we were talking about characters we talked about how it's gendered but we didn't really go into how it's gendered as characters so um aruba brought up a really interesting point about like male the difference between male and female characters in the books that we grew up with so you brought up um himu misirali they these were like multi dimensional thinking characters with like yeah. so many aspects to their personality and when you contrast these characters with humana it's female characters like nah, yeah and, uh, or just any other female character these female characters all they do is like cry yes yeah and cry <laughs> want to get married yeah want to get married finds a lot of um fulfillment in ending up with a guy yeah also there's like a lot of really weird portrayal of um these young girls in his books but we'll we'll get into that in some other yeah. episode Well I think speaking about characters it's also to do with like point of view because if you think about it, we don't have that many you have, we have Himu Himu Misirali but besides for like Rabindranath Tagore who like had a lot of female main characters in his books we don't really have Bangla literature any of those like you know very well known characters like we do for like Himu and Misirali we don't have that like females do we mm-hmm. Also with I point of view Yeah 
Yeah. Also, the point of view about like the thing that we were talking about, we were discussing about how growing up, like girls were more used to like watching cartoons and like series, books, or any anything like that has a point of view where the protagonist is a boy. And we watch like things that have the protagonist as a girl, but guys, they mostly watch and, and like consume a mit- uh, like literature and media that has protagonist as a as a boy. They're not used to like seeing the main character be a woman. They're not used to seeing our point of view the way that we are used to seeing the male point of view, like they're not used to seeing that. So I feel like we need to like normalize that. And I'm really happy about this thing called Her Stories. So they have children's books where the main characters are all female. And I have a, ma- I have a male niece and he's like six and he's like a big fan of these books. He's very excited about them. So I think like that's the start, like, like exposing bo- young boys to like m- literature and media that have a female point of view, you know? I think it goes to show just how much the nuance of female emotion is denied and the fact that we didn't grow up with these things but are we're still able to you know acknowledge and learn and express a lot of our emotions just goes to show how it is in every way it's so harmful and I think what you said is so apt exposing ourselves to considering even other perspectives of a situation um, of narratives that have been traditionally uh, traditionally where female emotion is seen as something you know non-existent or terrifying like I think of Medusa mm-hmm. um, the Greek myth yeah. of Medusa and how every single iteration of that myth involves her being you know this terrifying monstrosity and she needs to be killed and the like but you know in truth it glosses over the fact that she was assaulted and beyond that, like, you know, forced into isolation. And so that the complexities of her, you know, rightful anger and rightful sorrow, just not even acknowledged, let alone, you know, given the privilege of, of an like, academic. Right, like the, uh, us not having the female character's perspective goes to show how, because we have always, especially like males have always consumed media, which has a male protagonist in their point of view females or other gender diverse people are like secondary characters in their own yeah. lives and stories. Absolutely. And that is like, these secondary characters can't really feel like anger to the extent that they can. And even if they do, their anger doesn't, isn't validated as much these um, males' anger would be in their eyes. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Also, I think, yeah. I admit you, so like, I think we can totally move into how, um, culturally feminine rage has been represented because Medusa is definitely it's a Greek myth it's a big thing yeah. like I didn't even know about that Medusa part like like until like last year like I always thought that she was this evil person like growing up I didn't know the entire story like it's just presented that way in media you know I think it's really interesting to and we're gonna get into this later I think looking into why there's this privileging of male perspectives and values and their bodies and stories yeah. and <laughs> female perspective, even the presence Mm. of a woman is demeaned into, you know, backgrounded. And if our bodies are backgrounded, obviously our emotions are further, further raised. Also, I think an interesting point about why, like one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of female writers in the past isn't because we weren't interested in writing, isn't because like female, females don't like writing, it's because we were literally like denied education. So like I had a friend ask me why do why do like so few females have nobles why do majority of males like why is the most men are the ones with nobles I'm like excuse me we have not been given that opportunity in the past you can't just like compare and tally these things when we were not even given education for like the majority of history so yeah even then we came up with things like um, Sultana's Dream by Begum Rokia and um, yeah. Sufi Kamal being like. Did you guys hear that story about how when General, um, I was talking about how her people are beasts, she literally just stood up to him. She was like, if my people are beasts, your people are beasts, then you're the king of beasts. Like, she, she's just, I love that. every woman, just a literary activist, just standing up and screaming at a leader because, you know. Wow. Who, who did that? Was that Begum Rokea? No, no, that was, that was Sufi. Speaking of Begum Rokea, though, I think she's, you know, we have to acknowledge that there, because of this lack of social acceptance of women's anger, there has been so many ways women throughout history have had to navigate it. And like Begum Rokea, 
um, born in an ultra conservative Muslim household, you know, not allowed to read anything beyond the uh, religious scripture, going out of her way to create her own school to be advocating so strongly for female education and really showing up. And I think the denial of feminine anger takes root yeah. in that denial of uh, presence of not being allowed to, you know, have access. But in order to have access, you have to be allowed into these spaces. And so, yeah. you know, imagine, like I am, it's, it, you know, breaks my heart to admit, but being exposed to tales of these really outspoken, um, assertive Bengali women, these were not common in my childhood. And I'm sure, yeah. you know, that, yeah. that for sure, uh, a common experience, an unfortunate experience to share with a lot of other Bengali women. And um, it, like that goes to show that even though they're in our history, like yeah. intimately tied with our history are these, these figures of these assertive, really, you know, powerful figures, yeah. uh, female yeah. advocates and educators and, and uh, revolutionaries yeah. who are just backgrounded yeah, I, purely because they had the audacity to express that, express themselves. empowering hear about these people. I know that I've read of Begum Roke and all these people on Amar Boy in Bangla class, but there wasn't this emotional connection. And Shagarika, like what you said about how she wasn't allowed to read anything except um, religious scripts and stuff, I didn't know that. And I feel like right now that's really inspiring for me. It like reminds me of the quote by Netaji Subhash Chandrabos, big fan of him, that freedom is not given, freedom has to be taken. And like that reminds me of like her, how about how she wasn't allowed to read any, anything except Islamic scriptures, you know? And she went out of her way to get that freedom. And she was viewed as radical, as, you know, completely like Be'adov <laughs> and our, what does that do? And in where, where else have we seen uh, female emotion and power and emotional autonomy, sorry, emotional autonomy portrayed and reduced to just a thing um, associated whether with illness or with danger and the like, where it becomes something so threatening and so, so uncomfortable. Yeah. I think definitely like one of the examples would be with witches because like they burned these witches like that's a part of like why they weren't actual witches there were these people who were doing these things that came out in the public eye they were standing out from other women but there was no actual proof of them being witches so it's pretty interesting i think they were like trying to heal other people like they were looking into chemicals and just chemistry from what i've seen yeah. To, to my understanding, sorry, it's just they were women who, like many other ostracized women throughout history, you know, were vocal about their own practices. Um, they worked with medicine and healing and things like that. And, you know, like Arba mentioned, standing out. And yeah. instead of, you know, revering these women or the like, they, they were viewed as crossing a boundary yeah. of some sort, of being too expressive. And I think another great example comes to mind is the treatment of women experiencing mental illnesses in rural areas or the like, the diagnoses of hysteria yeah. throughout history. I feel like my personal theory on this is that men are just really not used to seeing female rage and when they do they're like shocked at it and they might like you know like freud started this whole thing with hysteria like hysteria was made by a man and the fact is men and women like our express ex expressiveness is different we were brought up to like we were allowed to be more expressive so how about when we're angry we are a bit more emotional because we are allowed to be more emotional but i feel like a lot of like when men see this they can't like really accept it they're not used to it they're not maybe they're used to seeing their mother scream but when they see someone their own age yell and it and it's not just some phony yell it is actually a scary threatening yell they don't know how to react to it i think oh even the mothers i don't think that's something like we'll go and get into this later when we talk about like society's uh, impacts on society but like I, I don't think they accept anger even when it's coming from their mothers yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I like the point you brought up, Aruba, you said something that really resonated with me. It's, it's as though hysteria is a yeah. feminine rage. And you see how like reinforced through language and representation and literature and medical history is this systematic mm -hmm. undermining of, fe of, of feminine yeah. emotion. And I, I just wonder what are the why is it such a threatening thing? And it, you know, we will explore that later on. But um, another 
um, figure that comes to mind in who exemplifies that uh, association between you know, the evil woman and the powerful woman yeah. is, you know, the religious figure of Kali. Yeah. Ma Kali I is literally like she is worshipped and she's feared. I think it's it's a good parallel to see on one hand where Medusa is feared yeah. to the point where she's like a monster. And on the other yeah. hand, Ma Kali's anger is seeing something that can end evil. So yeah. see both both of these um, traditions of anger has the understanding that fem- feminine rage is actually powerful enough to do something. Yeah. So it just just the differences in one hand they um, react to it by vilifying her. On the other oh. hand, they react to it by worshiping by um, giving her offerings. And Magali's um, tale is actually so interesting. She's yeah. like pissed. <laughs> she. Um, she goes on a rampage and then just puts the hangs the um, heads of men that she's killed around yeah. her neck, hungry for blood, and um, yeah, I think it. And and I just I really like the story about how she, how her anger was the force that was needed to end evil and kill all of these um, monsters and demons because she was like, she was on the good side of the battle. She was fighting these demons and monsters and um, we needed her to win the battle, right? Yeah. So I think it's, it was, I think I like the story so much because she is just all dark and scary and angry and her anger and aggression is the thing that, you know, ends evil and brings life to the world. Yeah. Not you know, thinking of characters and figures like Arundhati Roy and like who are so vocal um, in their, you know, say, criticism of powerful men, they're yeah. reduced to just their anger. It's never, yeah. okay, this is a, uh, you know, power, this is a like well-educated, um, prolific author, educator, professor and yeah. who's angry. It's always, this is, a woman who is angry and speaking from, you know, personal experience in the private sphere as well, like, you know, in our familial lives, I think there's just that gendered treatment of anger and of me expressing anger versus say my younger brother expressing anger. It is so clear to, you know, who is crossing what boundaries. I cross boundaries by being there and feeling that rage because Bangali culture has entrenched this inherent belief that, it's hysterical, you know, pagol not yeah. kama or pagol It's kama. like, even though you're older than him, the boundaries are different. And that's not Regardless fair. Of, of age, I think. And, you know, and you see this also in a lot of like Hindi serials and um, yeah. like, where um, the outspoken uh, daughter-in-law or the like yeah. someone who, you know, tries to hold someone in power accountable or yeah. points out something problematic, they're yeah. immediately demeaned and, yeah. you know, said like, yeah, interesting to me. I think, I mean, speaking from a South Asian context, it's really important to note that, you know, this culture of silence is yeah. really deeply embedded. And I mean, I won't get into it a lot now because we will explore the, you know, societal roots and the like, but, you know, it's, it, you see it. Um, it's glorified. It's glorified, yeah. it's, you know, celebrated, and it's expected, and it shows yeah. up in yeah. our own familial spheres as well, yeah. you know? So it's really, ter- it, I don't know the word for it, but it's, it's sickly fascinating how that patriarchal, um, narr- those patriarchal narratives of the wild woman yeah. and the crazy yeah. outspoken bitch, yeah. like it's all, um, yeah. forgive my language, it's all, it's, it's, it populates, you know, it begins yeah. in on Z Bangla all the way to Netflix. It's all the way to the West. Because I was thinking like how you said like patriarchy and the narrative. Well, the word hysteria was coined by Freud. And like, I know you guys read a lot of books and like classically, have you ever like, heard, like seen the word hysterics like, or hysteria used to describe a man? Because no, it's not like that woman is in hysterics. That's what I have never seen a man being like, said that he's in hysterics like it's not a thing even like i saw this episode on like the show freud and like it's a it's a female diagnosis it was invented like mostly for females and the majority women were like diagnosis as like hysteric if they had ptsd if they were expressing their emotions you're you're hysterical and men weren't allowed to like express their emotions at that time so older kato hysterical volatile because they're not allowed to do that so yeah it's literally a gendered word in my opinion hysteria and hysterics is a gendered word I think anger is, you know, for men, it is 
not just acceptable, but it's strength. It's, it's, you know, you're, you're dominating, you're, you're taking up like, oh, what a, you know, <laughs> nothing comes to mind. It's just like, wow, look at him. He's, what an alpha, <laughs> what an alpha. Yeah. Yeah. What a Chad or whatever. That was what came to my head. And I wonder, you know, what is it that, what is it that is so threatening? And because that is, that is why women, um, f feminine rage is viewed and depicted and vilified throughout media. It's because it's threatening to the status quo, to the patriarchal yeah. uh, structure, which under which think, women are just less. Yes, I think since we keep talking about why it's threatening, and I think Shagri was also bringing up some familiar um, examples, we can now kind of talk about um, media's influence on society and also kind of how those representations um, came up in the first place. So yeah. just let's try, start by answering the question, why is it so threatening? Why does it make people so goddamn uncomfortable when a, a, a girl or a woman is, you know, angry? And like, rightly angry, that's the thing. We have constructive and valid reasons to be angry about. We, injustice happens to us, abuse happens to us, assault happens to us, we get, um, we get bullied online for expressing our opinions. We get bullied online for having opinions. We Did you all know that the majority of online trolls are male? Like a vast majority of online trolls are men. I be like I wonder no, why that is. <laughs> Should I be shocked? Sorry. I think I hear you bring up such a fantastic point of, you know, we, we question, you know, why does it make people uncomfortable? And why is it so threatening when there's just an abundant amount of reasons to be infuriated you know we're living under a system that that historically and in the present moment views us as less and we're prevented from a lot of the same economic opportunities and when we get those economic opportunities we're accused of oh you filled the gender quota or whatever and i think yeah. a lot of that discomfort takes root in the fact that this is threatening a system you know it's not it's about it's threatening oh yeah. my just one man or the like yeah. it's threatening this really really deep rooted system yeah. of of ideas and and privilege and values that yeah. that puts male experience and just the yeah. class of male above all else and i think it really exposes the fragility of the system so when in the past you know our mothers and our grandmothers have been very long denied you know spaces like this podcast for example to be yeah. expressive and to you know share their voice and more importantly share their anger at the uh, abuse they've had to stomach and the like we are allowed to do that and i think because it's so new it's threatening yeah. and it's threatening to their image yeah to their ego yeah. and it really yeah. exposes yeah. how we need to get into these ideas and how yeah. it's threatening to their image and ego not just yeah. because like the system is like um you know the system is something that benefits them because we're not always yeah. angry about feminist issues or them being sexist. Yeah. We're, we're angry about racism. We're angry about educational opportunities. We, our anger and our understanding goes beyond just, Absolutely. you know, like feminism so and all that. Yeah. So I think that really comes into play, like to kind of preserve this image that um, they have. And like, uh, like uh, Aruba was talking yesterday about if you could just bring that up right now about how um, in front of their friends, they have to be this certain person. And if a girl yeah. dares, you know, speak up against him. How can you, how are you getting, you know, shattered by a girl? Exactly. I mean, let's like, let's talk about how men can beat us physically, but that's not enough for them. In any situation where we are competing with them on an intellectual level, and it, it comes to a situation where we can like beat them, you, you can see from all around, like guys are like, oh, you're gonna let a girl talk to you like that? Oh, you let a, a girl beat you. You got beat, like fight with a girl. It's it's crazy. Like it is a big ego thing, I feel like. And especially like it reminds me of what Arun Thadiroi said about how we had to fight for this. The reason we had to fight is because in a hierarchical system, hierarch I don't know, hierarchy, yeah. the people who are on top will want to preserve it. And I'm definitely not saying all men, we have a lot of feminist men, but I am saying that I have witnessed a lot of men who are, who, who are bothered. Let me say all men. Yeah, not all men, but a lot of men, they're not happy that they, that they have to compete with us. Like, on an, we're finally, like, for years, like, even our parents were, like, not on that equal level, but finally we're equal, and they have to compete with us for jobs and everything. And trust me, at least in Bangladesh, I know that there are a lot of men who are not happy with that. They don't want to compete for jobs with us. Trust me, they don't. They're not happy with that. They don't want that. 
I think it goes beyond just economic opportunity, you know, it's because, and I don't want to say that I necessarily blame a lot of the um, individuals engaging in a lot of, you know, uh, this resistance you see yeah. online and in these circles, but because it is part of the system we've all been forced to grow up under, a system that, you know, privileges male emotions and a system where we're not allowed to yeah. be angry. We're not allowed to express an anger. Sure, you can feel, you can feel yeah. it, but it's yeah. in you. It's meant to stay in you. And that, cu that culture of silence has mm -hmm. been preserved, you know, throughout our mm -hmm. grandparents' generation, our parents' generation. And mm -hmm. I think at the core of it is why do we feel so threatened? Because it goes against the reality. And yeah. it isn't agreed. It goes against them like getting away with a lot because it's definitely not just economic because I was thinking about how divorces are up on the rise. It's a lot to do with how the fact that we are not allowing men to get away with as much as we were in the past, you know? And I think that's another... why divorces are on the rise because Aga wasn't. <laughs> another we important thing, I think another important thing to mention is, you know, it's it the it's not about all men are out to, you know, yeah, get women and cut down women. It's not about that. It's just, you know, the page, you benefit off the patriarchy inherently. Yeah. You're a man. Yeah. And um, that's not something, that's an uncomfortable truth for sure, but it's not something you can really disentangle from. So I think, uh, I hear you brought up something about, you know, how it, it, there's always that vocal resistance at every level. Yeah. It's expected, you know, when I'm making a comment on Facebook or something like yeah. I have to take a solid 20 minutes and be like, okay, like, do I have the emotional energy to be yeah. dealing with the, you know, inevitable. That's a, that's a, it's so such an interesting point in the fact that how men are trolls, like more, more men are more like trolls are more likely to be men. I feel like it's cause like we think twice before expressing anger and like we think way more, we consider it way more. Should I be angry on this Facebook post? I feel like men, like it's easier for them to do it's, that. It's it, and also it, yeah, that whole thing with the white knight and simps. It's like I do feel like it's a hostile environment. Like if I comment something and then if a guy supports me, you're gonna call that guy a simp or a white knight. So that's crazy. Like you can't even get support from males without those males being called out. <laughs> They just want to get into my pants. That's what you think? Uh, really? Someone supporting my basic opinion on politics and you just think that they want to get into my pants. All I right. think that has so much to do with um, what we brought up earlier of how fem like we're just feminine rage is inherently invalid. Like it's never taken seriously because it's either, you know, hysterical or drama or, oh, how cute are you on your period? Or look, feminist, apu. Rationally asked to say, you know, it's it's things like that, that language, that um, systematic like devaluation, and in in a way, I think there's also because a lot of the people who benefit off of this system know that they have a position of power because that's where it takes root in, right? Even if they're not like yeah. conscious, oh, I have more power than this person. The system has, yeah. in, the patriarchy has in, indoctrinated that idea of superiority, yeah. and so yeah. you see a lot it's of um, very problematic because when we talk about well, we brought up power trips before as well they yeah. want to feel superior they find some form of personal gratification in humiliating us and insulting us and reducing our constructive anger to something such as yeah. having like you know you're just pmsing or something like that and they like yeah um so you know how Shagrika was talking we were we were talking about online interactions a lot because that is something that we deal with personally and we see so much um Oh, even if we say that all men aren't out to get, like, aren't out there to get us, if, if, like, if you comment something, there will be some form, they, not some form, or there will be, like, very direct resistance to yeah. it with, like, comments that follows, right? And yeah. even if it's a guy who's not going to go up against you, he's, he's going to be the one liking guys comment, and they're all like, oh my god, we're commenting, you like, they, we're, like, showing support, and just small things like this, Every guy, like every guy, does this. Take a say, but but like, can we talk about power trips and like making mm -hmm. women feel small and um, humiliated yeah. to kind of take away from their anger? Sure. Like, even if it isn't explicitly said, I yeah. notice that you know, in online interactions and beyond that, you know, personally, like in my familial spheres and also in like academic spheres, yeah. there are there's such an abundance of 
men who feel the personal need to be <laughs> who feel the personal need to be playing devil's advocate yeah. to be speaking out against you you can have and i like this is something that i have noticed my entire life in school um yeah. and something that i know is not unique to me you know i do have a lot of privilege of being more outspoken uh the like but at the same time you see it it doesn't matter how loud you are. And I just said this at the beginning, it's, you know, it's not your opinion they're attacking, it's the fact that you have an opinion. And so I think there's so many, like you, if you're hearing this, I am so sure as a biological female, especially instances of, you know, men mobbing you in the comment section or calling you out on something or, you know, attacking your character yeah. and the like, these are all very um, common experiences. And I hear you uh, dating, and I'm sure there yeah. to be, oh, it was just dark humor, it's hypothetical, it's ironic, and they debate rights. Like, I know in social situations, people interrupt each other's conversations. It's not only a gendered thing, it happens to guys, but honestly, I do notice that happens a bit more to women than no, it, I, to guys. I, it is a systematic. It is yeah. systematic. The constant... Um, demeaning and interrupting yeah. and dehumanization and i know these are very strong terms but I, I i bring them up to highlight how there is an environment of entitlement and it is violent because it doesn't matter if it's a facebook comment section or your house yeah. or 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 a classroom women's voices and god forbid women's expressive voices and anger it is valued less and because it's valued less it allows and enables other actors usually of a different gender although many female misogynists also exist yeah. it allows them to you know speak out against you shut you down as aruba mentioned because they think they have that right they have that right to that space any space you yeah. take up is a violation of socially accepted boundaries for oh what can a woman say and not say doesn't yeah. matter who you are or how how many how qualified you are, how educated you are, mm. you will have to, it is inevitable yeah. that there will be some yeah. men often, yeah. uh, or gender diverse person, if we want to be yeah. inclusive, yeah. who finds it a personal, who, take, who finds it's a personal vendetta to yeah. be speaking out against you. And they say, mm -hmm. oh, I'm playing devil's advocate. You're taking things too seriously. But even that is invalidating your yeah. reaction. At this point, it's really important for me to acknowledge my own personal implications um, in being an unfortunately active spectator in this uh, culture of entitlement. And I know that this is not an isolated experience either, um, but you know, having the privilege of being able to share and move past a lot of this stigma is that this culture of violence, which Oprah brings up, it is not only replicated, but reinforced and evolving in familial spheres. I know, so I am you know, very lucky to come from a comparatively liberal family um, and being the oldest daughter, but nonetheless, it's so much of my life has been spent learning how to, and being forced to endure and stomach this understanding that I am of less worth. My words, my emotions, my expressions of rage especially are inherently of less worth. And you see, I think the most glaring example of uh, entitlement and uh, respectability, the boundaries of what is allowed and what isn't, is it shows up in forms of emotional abuse and physical abuse. And like Aruba mentioned, you know, uh, if you grow up watching, say, your father scream at your mother and mm -hmm. nothing comes out of it, no one is held accountable, it's going to show up in your own life. And I, you know, in my own family, having a younger brother, and um, I have experienced violence um, from him um, that was, you know, rooted in a lot of anger. And when I would, and when I've, you know, fought back and defended myself, I was made to feel that this was my fault, even though the instigator, the yeah. instigator was clear. And he was like 16 at the time, and I was, you know, in college, and yet it was always So you see that normalization, yeah. and yeah. you see how, even though there is that sudden, like in this particular situation, there is an opportunity to educate 
Mm -hmm. you know a man on okay you have more power in the situation you know physical strength and the like but also you have to remember that it's not okay and yet because his expression of anger was more acceptable yeah and mine wasn't i the blame was pinned on me and you see how unfortunately women are thus forced to sort of like dilute themselves and water mm -hmm. down their anger and express their anger in a lot more subdued ways even though men can get away with violence men can get away with shouting and screaming and breaking things or disappearing but the moment i raise my voice even a little bit yeah. shut down yeah. it is an intensely popular cultural issue in bangladesh and i and i think you know one of you brought up earlier it teaches girls to be small Yeah. It teaches girls to, you know, reduce themselves yeah. and say, oh, I actually am not offended by that. Like mm -hmm. Facebook, like social media, yeah. you, I doubt myself. I'm typing out a comment. I'm studying political mm -hmm. science. And when I'm thinking about, oh, engaging with this boy yeah. on, you know, maybe one article about politics, I'm like, should I, is it worth yes. it? What yeah. will they say? It really is so harmful and it shows up in us, around us and it is it creates a cycle yeah first Very of all I'm so, so so sorry you had to go th go through that with your brother the sad part of that is that this is our generation and like this is the future generation so you would think that that's in the past but we need to wake up and realize that no it's not in the past no it's not it's it's well alive absolutely there yeah. i hear you were saying something Yes, I think since you're talking about how you doubt yourself when you're typing out comments, I think with that we can move into how we've kind of internalized this shame. We've kind of internalized being small and not being angry about, um, uh, you know, just being ashamed of our anger even, or just taming it, not using it, yeah. just putting it up away in some box, doubting ourselves time and time again. So yeah. how, I'm just asking you guys, how have you guys internalized this kind of behavior? Like what has this um denial of feminine rage done to your own anger um, uh, personally i think a lot of it is like labeling it as drama and trying to avoid that drama by being a pacifist you know like mahatma gandhi like quoted jesus about like if someone slaps you turn the other cheek i feel like it's, it's a lot to do with that like we just and i'm like done with that like i'm 20 now 21 now and i'm not gonna let that happen anymore i am now for the new netaji shubhas chandra pose way if someone slaps you hit them on both cheeks because you don't get to start if you start an argument you should expect me to get equally angry and i i do feel like there's like this invigorating power in being angry you literally see the shock in other people's faces like this is what an angry female's voice sounds like uh, what because you in movies you Uh, to, to answer the question of how is one internalized, I have to say, everybody, thank you for sharing. That was a very empowering uh, thing to hear. It's like, you know, I want to be more angry in my day-to-day -day life. Um, my answer is a little, unfortunately, a little more complicated. And I think this is, unfortunately, another reality shared with a lot of, you know, women of color and, and people who identify as women. Um, it is dangerous to be angry. And in a lot of these public, space, public spheres and private spheres, it is... It can threaten, it can, you, you can be risking your life to be, you know, taking up that space that is yours, to be using your voice and to be, you know, like you said, like screaming and shouting and calling out what's wrong. And I think, you know, personally, I have internalized a lot of that fear and, it, and, and coming from, you know, like a, an abusive household and the like, it really teaches you that it is dangerous to be taking up so much space with your rage. It is, it is wrong and it should not be done. And if you're doing it, well, you have to face the consequences and the consequences are often violent. So I think, you know, I, I, I've internalized that smallness um, and sort of, and I mentioned earlier, like diluting my anger. So that could be, you know, beginning sentences with, I think, or I don't yeah. know, but, or maybe, um, where there's not a lot of assertion in my words. It's yeah. always so much lingering doubt. I uh, hear you brought up yeah. shame. I think that is such a potent word for it because yeah. what happens when you've spent your entire life being told that, nah, Aisha, will the high now or the cheek now? Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you don't speak or you, you, you shrink yourself. 
Yeah. And a lot of the neutral language we use and a lot of, um, uh, a lot of the confidence, I think, is you're deprived of a lot of confidence. And I'm definitely like, you know, even now today, like almost 20, um, like th halfway done with, with my degree, I still fear, you know, speaking up, speaking loudly. So yeah. it is definitely not something that just stays with you in that moment. It manifests in so many ways. Yeah. And, and it really, uh, I think, and this is unfortunately, you know, a common, <laughs> another common experience for most women. They think that, you know, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't yeah. speak out against the sexist comment. Maybe I, I shouldn't, you know, express how I feel about, how I felt about this essay in class. Yeah. Because you don't, you know that you're going to be, there's going to be resistance. Yeah, you and just want to, uh, what I was saying is that when I talk, uh, when I want to answer my question, I think something similar comes up. Um, not just I starting my questions with I think, but also ending them in question marks. Yeah. You know, like oh. maybe. Yeah. Oh my like, God, I feel that, yeah. <laughs> that's just what I, I think i'm not sure very recently that Sorry. yeah i very really recently that even with my male friends that i trust that i spent like so much of my high school and a lot of my childhood with even around them when i'm talking and it's not just you know something political or social it can be a science thing like i could be talking about a physics formula and I'd be like um is it this like isn't it this uh, aren't you doing it wrong not like if you're doing it wrong, this is how you do it. Like, you know, just even because I see them interacting among themselves and they're so assertive and they're so like, you know, at ease with their opinions. Yeah. And I am not, I am not, that's, that's the word, right? I am not at ease with what I want to express. So I think that's okay. some, that's how I've internalized it. Like just doubting um, of what I'm going to say and also repercussions. Oh my God. So <laughs> I don't know if I should be saying this, but it's like, firstly, repercussions, yeah, what Shaurika said, violence, that is a very, very, very important angle. We really, really need to start talking about how when women speak up, they expose themselves, they, they, are, they are vulnerable to potential abuse and violence from men. Yeah. But also in like nuanced interactions among your classmates and even with your teachers, like, I don't know. So in my classes, when I used to do classes in A-levels, um, for example, the teacher would make a sexist remark. And everyone just would just look at me like, okay, I'm your feminist. feminist. Like, you know. Are you feminist? No. <laughs> How are all the high school you? So, uh, what are you going to say now? And everyone would just, Eto, the, the, the word is mojanewa. Yeah. And seeing me get yeah. angry is something that is my right. Yeah. I am a girl. I am a human being who can't walk the streets without being yeah. groped, without being assaulted. You think? Me feeling angry about that, feeling disturbed about that is fun. Yeah. So I feel like because that's something that kind of stopped me from speaking out in classrooms for a while. I got back to it. Yeah. I'm fine with being feminazi yeah. that just, like that disrupts phys yeah. uh, yeah. physics or chemistry class. It's fine with me. But like that definitely that's something that I internalized for a while. Just yeah. because like all these boys would gang up on me, like, you know, yeah. ki, yeah. Korba, abar, ki korba, like Please? let's see what yeah. I feel like in that sense, I, I really look up to both you and Ahir in that sense, because both of you are so outspoken, like Ahir with your podcast, Shagarika with your activism. I feel like how you said about how we like shrink ourselves, like with me, it's like I shrink my words. Like I have so much to yeah. say, but I like if it's this big, I want to make it this small because like, oh, why am I caring so much about other people's attention spans? If you care about this, and if I'm angry about it, I want to be, I, I think I'll put that effort and I, I, won't, I don't want to care anymore about other people's attention spans. If I'm angry, I'll express it. That's that's very inspiring and empowering. I think let's like think at this point in podcast, let's just talk about how we navigated through those internalized ideas and how we choose to find anger. Like how do we let anger empower us now that we are aware of its magical and terrifying destructive powers? I think um beginning to even acknowledge and and really give it a name is really powerful you know uh, mm -hmm. a, a lot of my you know minim a lot of how i would minimize myself and still today you know minimize myself i would never have called it that i was just like asha this is this is just how it is or if feeling that sense of you know feeling that it bubbles inside you and you're like something is wrong here or like i said like you know when when threats to your safety like not being able to walk out on the street because i live in fear that oh I'm not wearing an orna today. What's going to happen to me? It's a joke to people. Like yeah. that anger, I've never been able to call it anger. So I think beginning the first 
way I personally uh, began to navigate a lot of this complicated relationship I share with, with anger that has been for so much of my life been violently suppressed or, or been demeaned is just by telling myself, like, I allow myself to feel angry. It is not just okay, but it's expected. And no one can take that right away from me. So yeah. I, I think it's a really, like you, that question you just asked is so important. Like how, it, it is a navigation because especially in yeah. Bengali society where there are so many complex familial dynamics of you know, respect and uh, intergenerational trauma and things yeah. like, and silence, it is, yeah. women, like Bengali women, they, we ask ourselves often like, Ki korara, like Ki kor, yeah. Ki korara, yeah. what can we do with what we have? So beginning to see your anger as anger, it's so rec reclamative and it is really one step at eroding that normalized sexist mm -hmm. belief that, yeah. oh, it's wrong. Yeah. This isn't right. I feel shame. And I think, you know, shame is probably the, uh, an, another very, like, lot jata hake, right? It still lingers yeah. in me today. And one thing that I try to remind myself is that, you know, I am here and privileged enough to be able to share these things with other women because I have the privilege of knowing, knowing that this yeah it's not how it needs to be my yeah. voice is my voice like i do not believe in the voiceless it is yeah. only the forcefully silenced yeah. so reminding yourself of that is a really yeah. Yeah. powerful step towards reclaiming <laughs> that rage as yours it's not like which are, it's not passion it's not frustration it's none of that it's pure violent fury and anger because of how yeah. we're being treated it's repressed anger because I love you for bringing up like um, street harassment and stuff because if you think about it repressing anger is kind of a survival instinct in that situation it is. like Absolutely. you're like you the anger that you feel that when you're like walking and like these people are harassing you they're staring at you like in such a bad way they're singing and stuff you are told that you should not react because that's going to be bad and you know that that's probably going to be bad so you just repress that inside and how many times do we go out we go out like agatha every day so that's that's something you're facing every day and i also love you for bringing up privilege because i feel like it's two-sided like number one i feel like all of us here are very privileged because we had like the books and the resources that the we had to, like have these opinions novels. yeah the youtubes and the novels and everything we all had those and so that's why we have these opinions and i feel like there there's probably a lot of people who don't have these opinions who are even women who don't have these opinions so like i want to extend that privilege to other women and the second privilege that i want to talk about is like male privilege because in the sense is when i talk when i walk in the street with a guy i've been told like three or four times like this is what it's like for you to walk in the street like a probably like this is everyone stares at you people are always staring at you and, and welcome to being a girl then so i feel like male privilege should be like addressed in the sense that wake up like like realize these things and also like give women that that space just to talk you know stop like interrupting stop invalidating women with like are you on your period thing you know that's that's bullshit like my anger is i'm the like, angry hobona at something right even if i'm on my period and i'm angry that anger is still like valid you know exactly it's not coming out of yeah. nowhere you know yeah i think I, extending that privilege is a very apt response to how we navigate like how we use anger to empower us it's also building more safe spaces where other women can be angry around us. It's mm -hmm. allowing them to be angry, but also acknowledging their um, feelings as anger, their emotion as anger and reminding them of it, building that, those networks where they feel safe to express their anger, where their anger is validated, where their anger mm -hmm. is heard, where we share the same kind of um, anger. Um, I, I feel like that's a very uh, important thing that that's like, I, if, if, People who are watching this, I think that's a very important takeaway for you to have, to build those safe places and networks for other women to be able to be angry. Yeah. You know, reclaiming our anger. And since this episode is about media and movies and literature, are there any characters that you guys want to like, since, since our episode is coming to an end, do we want to talk about any characters that kind of inspired us and empowered us? Because I have quite a few, especially in recent times. Do you guys see the movie yeah. Bubble? Yeah, I, I did. Yeah. I've heard things about it. It was badass. She's badass. <laughs> so I think, like, um, uh, also, again, uh, Kahani Vidya Balan. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I can't pronounce her name. Vidya Bal Bal Balan. Yeah. Vidya Balan. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, capturing her name. But, like, you know how in these two movies, in one, she has, like, she channels her anger and uses it as a tool to bring a terrorist to justice? 
Yeah. And on the other hand, Bobo's rage is just not confined. It's all over the place. She's on a rampage. Just, I feel like in recent times, women and storytellers are finding yeah. ways to, um, like, ways for their characters to kind of embody definitely Feminine. Yeah. even like with the disney like um movies i feel like it's getting a bit better like the redhead curly girl from like that Marino, oh, brave brave yeah i feel like she's a pretty good um character she's pretty brave <laughs> i have a scary scary yeah. did any of you read oh Carrie? yeah she's oh, badass oh scary yeah yeah stephen king oh yeah for sure i was yeah. i think you one know, of the first exposures like, really. and like she just it blew my mind away. Reading that book blew my mind away. Just yeah. it was very boring and violent, yes. Yeah. But like maybe that's how feminine rage is sometimes. It's red and um yeah. violent. And Absolutely. It's, it's disruptive. Yeah. It's yeah. disruptive and it's inspiring. I honestly love Carrie. It's one of my yeah. favorite books. It's one of my favorite um, characters for the audience. If you don't know, she's she's a character with telekinetic powers, and she basically destroys her entire high school and ends up killing a lot of people. <laughs> they like pour pig's blood on her, like they embarrassed yeah, exactly. her. Yeah, her. And she's, she's also humiliated and kind of um, made to feel ashamed time and time again by her mother. And mm-hmm. like this shame, kind of allowed this rage to build up that ultimately, you know, led to everyone's destruction. So I just amazing book. <laughs> Go ahead and read it. It's amazing, definitely. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's so rare. When I was thinking about the answer to this question, I was like, it's so rare to find representations of, you know, women who are expressing their anger and it's like not an evil or um, evil thing or demean thing. Rare, what I yeah. find is, this is actually a very rare example from the past, but Mulan, um, Disney's yeah. Mulan, is one of the most formative films like in my what life. Do? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Watch seeing this, you know, non white woman you know, be denied choice and being told that you can't do this and uh, you're not allowed to go off to war for people who aren't familiar with the story. Um, She disguises herself as a man and goes off into war to, you know, protect her uh, family's honor in place of her disabled father. And throughout the whole film, she's just, you know, constantly doubted and um, constantly doubted and demeaned and she, she stands her, she stands her ground. She's so assertive and unapologetic. So yeah. I think having, um, you know, I swear, and you know, in a more Bangladeshi uh, context, like you know, being surrounded by like women like the people I'm sharing this podcast episode today, just seeing, you know, whether it's in, you know, like whether it's at social gatherings or uh, you know, like competitive events or even online, just bearing, being able to bear witness to all these women who are, you know, making that risky comment, yeah. calling out that, that guy, or, you know, pointing out something problematic in a film or the like, something they don't disagree with. These are places I draw strands from. And these are sources of, of hope and of yeah. inspiration that really help me in unlearning so many yeah. of the harmful, uh, yeah. reductive um, expectations that were instilled in us that we explored earlier in the episode that have been instilled in us, that have taught us to police our own anger. So it's very empowering to be here today and to bear witness to this. And like both of you mentioned, there is more and more content coming out um, every day and there's people creating it who look like you and I. So I know we're a little over time out here, sorry, but uh, it's there's a really powerful, um, in my own journey of unlearning, a lot of these very, <laughs> deeply embedded um, ideas of my worth and the worth of my words and the worth of my anger. Uh, there's a poem comes to mind by Audre Lorde, who was this, you know, powerhouse African-American uh, poet. Um, and, so um, and it comes from uh, her poem, a litany, a litany for Survival. And I'm just, I, if it's possible just to read like one stanza, like it's really short, yes, but please do. it is, uh, so, and um, so the whole poem is, it's basically sort of this, she's speaking to you, to you, the reader, she's speaking. And I, what's so powerful, and I think throughout this entire um, episode, we've highlighted how feminine rage, we're made to feel like it's isolating, but it's not. It is, it is anything but. Uh, so, and when the sun rises, we are afraid it may not, it might not remain. 
when the when our stomachs are full we are afraid of indigestion when our stomachs are en empty we are afraid we may never eat again when we are alone we are afraid love will never return and when we speak we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed but when we are silent we are still afraid so it is better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive so that's it guys don't forget to like and subscribe i can't believe i'm saying that now but <laughs> please share and like and subscribe and tell your friends about this emery feminazi podcast that's happening for south asian women and um that's it my thanks for having us out here so much for having us out here